In part one, appalled at the thought of putting his hand in his pocket to buy an off-the-shelf e-bike, we saw mechatronics engineer Ray Cook set off to build his own. Having created the heart of the bike with his own hands, we now see if he can bring his barefoot bike to life and within his £200 budget. Ray, how's it going? Oh, hi Steve. Right, what you got? Welcome to the workshop. What have I got? I've got my bike, my barefoot bike. But Ray, that's that's like a bike I'd have ridden as a child. That's a push bike, that is. Where's the motor? Oh, the motor's around here. That's the motor. It's a flat motor. It's called a pancake motor. Right. I bet you've never seen one like that I before. I haven't seen one of them before, Ray. That's right. What are you going to do with that? Bolt it in the back wheel? Well, I'm going to put it on the back wheel or alongside the back wheel and I'm going to hide it under a pannier or one of those pannier bag things. Pannier. And no one will know I've got it and I'll be an oldie on patrol. <laughs> Looks like you need to hide it under a trailer. <laughs> no, it only weighs 2.8 kilograms, so it's not that heavy. How much was that? That was 25 pounds. 25 pounds? Yeah, but it was very expensive when it was new, but you can pick them up off eBay, so it's not expensive. And it's got a pulley on it, so everything's ready to roll. How many watts? That's 250 watts, so it fits in with everything, really. So what's next, Ray? Well, I gotta build it up now. And what we've got is the hub, which we made before. So I'm gonna put that there for the moment. Because what I've gotta do is I've gotta make sure that I've got everything I want on the outside of the bike of basic mechanics. And so what I need is I need something to help me hold the motor. So the first thing is I've got the motor and I've got a big battery to go on the back. So I've got this bit of wood, which I've made up just roughly, so it gives me an idea what to do. That goes on there. It's gonna act as a mudguard as well. And we'll just lift it up a bit so it doesn't go on the wheel. And the next thing is I've got the motor. Now the motor, which we saw earlier, is mounted on a motor plate. It's one of these 10 mil plastic plates. And I'm gonna mount this so that it's supported. And so here we go. We've got a six mil bolt through the fork end arm and we're gonna pop that on like that. We're gonna roll that over there like that. You can see it's not quite in line there, but if we lift this up, we can get that to go there. We can put a spacer behind to hold it, but more importantly, we can attach a grip on here to hold it onto the fork coming down, and across at the back, we can put in a proper arm. Here we go. Oh. Now I've got control of the bike again. The motor plate, I'm just holding in position to make sure that it is where I want it. There's a six mil bolt that comes through here. I can put a um, nut on there and a washer. That will secure it there. And also I can put some fittings behind here. On the top here, I can put the battery. And if I want to put a couple of plates there to retain the battery, just to make sure it doesn't go anywhere, I can put those on and screw those on. Are those metal plates, Ray? No, these are plastic lightweight ones. We keep everything as light as we can. Unfortunately, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spend money on a pannier. I know they're only 15 to 30 quid, but I have this bit of wood and it's free. That goes under the battery, so the battery gets a soft ride. Where did you steal that from? That, I think that came from the kitchen. Anyway, I'm gonna take the motor off now. I'm happy with that. And I'm just going to look at the way that we hold the motor at the back edge. And that is what we have is a piece of square box and we've got a barrel run through with an eight mil thread in it. This is something that's pretty good because if we drop a screw through and we put that down like that, we really get some really good tension and it also stops it wobbling. So we go through there, that's gonna go up there. The end of it's gonna be bolted on here. Now that I've got the pannier on, I can mark off here with a scribe exactly where that's going to be and pull it up a bit and lock it on and that'll give us a solid support for the motor. So what I've done now is I've made sure that the motor mount is sorted and that my battery support is sorted. Ray, what's that hinge in the floor? It looks like it's fallen out of your door. Oh, that's the last part. You're jumping ahead of me. This is the final little bit. This bike is pretty well equipped with lots of hankwish fixings. There's one there, one there, one here, there's some elsewhere. What do you call them? Hankwish fish fixings, I call them, but they're probably called something more technical. Anyway, what we want to do is we want to make sure that this doesn't ride off this stem. So I've got a little hinge here, aluminium, fits up there. I put the Allen key screw in there. 
couple of screws this end, couple of screws that end, ordinary wood screws, and that with another one on the other side will really hold this down. It's not gonna go anywhere, even if I get someone sitting on the back. I've now mounted properly the pannier with the hinge at the front located into one of the Allen key slots. I have the box section running down and secured at the end of the forks. The motor's in position on the plate that we had and I put on two cheap bits of plastic Pro-Tem so I can put my battery on there. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to swing this round so we can see the working parts. You'll see straight away that the box section is copied on this side so that this side is supported just the same as the other side. That gives it anti-racking possibilities so the thing won't move about. The derailleur, of course, is still working. All seven speeds are available. The front clangers are okay too. What's a clanger? What's well, a clanger? A clanger is a distribution generally of three cogs on the front, on the hub here, or the front. Yeah. There was only two in my day when I was a youngster. I didn't get up to three. Hey Ray, I've got to ask you a question. Surely. You, you made that pulley for the back wheel. Yeah. How do you know what size pulley to make? Well, it doesn't really matter with the actual uh, pulley. As far as size is concerned, it's the gearing that you can get. And that, is, that depends on two things. One, the number of teeth on the drive and the number of teeth on the driven. On this one, the ratio is about 9.3 to 1, if you want to be exact. This has got 15 teeth and that's got about 125, 130 teeth. I can't remember how many. 9 to 1, 9.3 9 to 1, not very good. Should really be between 12 and 16 to 1. But there we go. So, so Ray, what, what, what effect does the ratio have on the final masterpiece? Well, if you've got 9 to 1 or 9.3 to 1, which this is, you'll find that you're rather highly geared. It's like driving a car in top gear or even in overdrive. So when you come to a hill, it doesn't do very well. In fact, you can get a refusal out of this because you'll drop out because you take too much current. On the flat, it's a serious speed. This bike will probably, according to my calculations, and we haven't tried it yet, probably do close on 30, 35 miles an hour on the flat without too much wind. That'll be on a private road, right, right? That's a private road, yeah. Yeah, there's a few around here too. I'm friendly with a farmer. So I can go and trial that later. There are two things about the belt that we should think about. Firstly, there's a problem called tooth shear. And with tooth shear, you can have the teeth actually being ripped off the belt. And generally it happens because there's too much force or there's not enough of the belt in contact with the pulley. Here, you can see that the belt is turned back over a roller. And this is very common and seen in most systems to ensure that there's a good grip on the small pulley. It doesn't matter on the large one, you don't need it. There's the free wheel, working quite well. Very little drag on that. And here we see the belt, you may or may not, just see the belt there, is hidden by this flange plate which I popped on to give extra protection so that twigs and bits of grass don't actually get in the drive so easily. It's not so good when you're doing 40 miles an hour, right? It's not, because it could stop things going and there might be a bit of burnt rubber from a stopped wheel, you never know. I think there's going to be burnt rubber full stop. Yeah, well, let's hope I am burning rubber shortly. Anyway, we are now coming to the end of the mechanics. We just uh, reprise this into, say, the motor's on, the drive's on. The box section at the back is done and the position here is ready for the battery. And the groceries. And the what? Groceries. The grocery. Groceries. Groceries. You mean beer. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you mean. There's just enough room for the beer crate, but it is strong enough to take a person sitting on there. That's how good it is. All good barefoot technology. From the barefoot bike. Absolutely. Now we're going to go on to the electrics and see how they go. And uh, hopefully it won't be long before we have spinning wheels and burning rubber. Barefoot engineering, simple, not too complicated and very reliable. And this is all the electronics. That's all there is. There's no more than that. 
It's not even a string of sausages. So what we've got is we... What does it do? What does it do? This one controls the speed of the bike and it tells you what percentage of your power you've got. 36 volts coming off the battery and this will tell you whether you're driving with one volt or 36. It won't tell you the speed you're going, but we'll see this illuminated later when it's working. There's some important bits to this system. There's not very much. There's the emergency stop button, which you can have somewhere on the bike. There's the speed control, which unfortunately is just a little pot, we call it a potentiometer, a little pot, which is on the dashboard at the front. A twist grip would be better, even better than that, a thumb control. But the most important thing we have on here is this switch. This is a 20 amp switch, and if everything goes tits up, we can switch everything off. So that's your on off switch? That's the on off switch for everything. And when we wire everything up, the first thing we do is we go over here and we look for the battery, the battery connection, which goes on there with the fuse. We take the fuse out before we do anything. The fuse, I've got a 15 amp here, but it came with a 40 amp, is there. When we've got it all wired up, we then check everything, pop the fuse in, we're ready to go. But that is important that when we start wiring, that is out, just in case we've got everything connected up. We're gonna do the dashboard now, and it's pretty simple. So the first thing, we wanna mount the speed control unit, and we can do that by using a couple of cable ties and we'll pop them through the holes and strap it on. The switch is in position already. The speed control, which is this small one, pops through there and we can put the knob on top, ready to go. The emergency button we'll leave for the moment and we'll put it here alongside this hand grip for action. This is how the dashboard fits. There's two clips on the handlebars Put a 5mm through there, another 5mm through here, locate them through the holders, and there it is, fitted. It's best to keep your cables neat. If they're flopping about and cause a loop, something is going to get caught in them. So just make sure you've got enough room under there, and then with a cable tie, just slip it through. But be careful when you do this, because you don't want to actually get any of your pull lines there that go down uh, outside the Bowden cables. And there we go, slip this in on here. What kind of information is the controller going to tell you? It's only going to tell me the amount of power that is available and going down to the motor. It's not going to tell me the speed, it's not going to tell me the revolutions. In fact, it's going to tell me virtually nothing. But it will tell me how much I'm using, that's all. And talking about how much, how much was that controller? That was uh, 13 pounds, but the price has gone down. You can get it for 11 now. 11 pounds? 11 quid. Controller. Yeah, it takes 40 amps on the drive and it goes up, up to 60 volts. So it's a pretty good bit of kit. Crikey Ray, you must have spent all of 100 pounds so far. No, I don't know. We'll go through the prices in a few moments. I didn't spend very much because, uh, you know, I got an aversion to spending money. We're nearly there, just one more tape on and the cable will be secure and then we'll do the final connections and once we've done the final connections we're going to burn rubber, well we won't be burning rubber I hope, I hope there'll be no friction, it'll just be we'll do a test by running the system and uh, that's where I'm going to use my strength to lift it up, oh 25, 26 kilos of the arse end of it. Connecting up the motor, putting the cables into the strip connector and making sure that they're good and tight. Because if they're loose and sloppy, you could get a burnout. So we're gonna make sure that they're really tightly connected. Gonna connect the system to the battery now. We push that on, make a good connection with it. And then we can put the fuse in right away to make sure that the system has a chance of working. Cover the fuse up. And sometimes these fuses don't fit very well and that's when you get a bad connection and things can go wrong. Anyway, we're ready now to see if anything is going to happen. So Ray, we are T minus, right? Absolutely. Do and we have ignition here? We have. I'm going to make the switch. The switch is on. I've got three zeros in a row, which means no power. So what we'll do now is we'll pull up the back wheel, 
and we'll put some power on. There we go. Barefoot is alive. It is. Burning rubber. Barefoot is alive, Ray. There's a bit of wobbling there, but I think it's the 100 uh, pound wheel, or let's say the wheel on the 100 pound bike, which has wow. uh, probably got a fat, a fat spot in the inner tube. My, that's my guess. Anyway, you we won't see it. You've got to be happy with that. Well, let's take it for a test run and see. We gotta see what happens. The proof of the pudding is in the riding of the bike. Ray, uh, what's, what are we gonna do? We're gonna take it down the road and obviously we're gonna, you're gonna start off with your power mode, right? Well, what we're gonna do, what I want to do is I wanna find out how it acts as a moped. I'm just gonna help it get up to speed because it's a bit highly geared. This is the first attempt at building one of these. And then in moped, I won't pedal and I'll see what speed she does. Okay. Calculated speed. I've got on my piece of paper, right? And uh, we'll now we're into empiricism. In and we'll see what it does. Okay, so a bit of empirical analysis now. So I'm on my uh, high bike, and it's got the uh, speedometer here. So we'll see. Uh, obviously, this bike cuts out at 15 miles an hour or 25 kilometers an hour. So Ray, take it away. Okay, let's go. So Ray's now at 50% and as you can see he's not pedalling. I'm doing 20 kilometres an hour. Oh, he's turning it up. He's turning it up. I'm now doing... I'm now actually on my limit. I'm on my limit and Ray is actually just leaving me. I'm now pedalling under my own steam at 27. He's actually gone. <laughs> he's gone. <laughs> What a legend, what a legend. He must be doing, yeah, he must be doing. Although I'm a bit scared. That bike is actually not made for a motor. Oh, here he is. Wow, Ray. Wow. 35 kilometers and climbing. I was going even faster. <laughs> I think it would have gone up to 40. Oh, 100%, yeah. I mean, I was doing uh, 30 kilometers an hour and you were leaving me. That's right. Well, <laughs> there you are. That's what, what was like. What was that? That's scary. That's putting power on <laughs> when you're not moving. <laughs> are you happy? Yep, that's pretty good. That's better than expected. Do we want to check out what we should have and what we got and see if it ties up? Now, first of all, the calculations, dynamic calculations for everything we have. Dynamic calculations here. That's it. It says that I should be able to do 35.99 kilometers an hour. Wow. And I was doing all of that. That's, that's, pretty, ac that's pretty accurate. Yeah, that's accurate, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, that's 22.496 miles per hour. 22.49 miles an hour, wow. Yeah. So there you are, so it's pretty good. I tell you what, I was beginning to feel that uh, it was a bit dangerous at the end. <laughs> it looked dangerous. It was, yeah. So I think we'll have to drop the gearing on this a bit. Yeah. But uh, it certainly was going. It was going for gold. Yeah. I've uh, really like a kick in the pants. Right, Ray, uh, time for some final costs. The sheep are moving in on us. Um, how much did this build cost? Let's start off with the, with the chassis itself, the frame. Basic bike from Halfords. About a hundred pounds a good few years ago. One hundred pounds. One hundred pounds. Ching. That's Motor. it. Motor. Twenty-five pounds. Twenty-five pounds. Twenty-five pounds. End of line. A two fifty watt motor. Two fifty watt pancake motor. Yeah. End of line. Um, let's move on to. You. Obviously, you had to make uh, the pulley and the the tensioner. Pulley was. And the, and the belt. Yeah. The belt's nine pounds. The tensioner is two small bearings, three quid. Now we've got. An extra bearing on the main hub at the back. That's about two pounds fifty. And we've got a bit of plastic. Let's say two quid. We've got the controller. Ah, the controller. I love that controller. I know. I mean, that is that's a that's, that's so beautiful. That's my favourite part actually. All lit up. There it goes. It tells you the percentage of power yeah. that you're using. I can tell you something. I mean, you know, I'm used to riding these amazing bikes, but no bike, no e-bike I've ridden has got a controller like that. <laughs> I tell you what, if you come to a hill that's really steep and you've got to get off, you can set this for the bike to pull you up at about five miles an hour, 
So it's like pushing a pram. It's easier than just walking on your own. So you've got that side and you can select what you want. And when you don't want it, just knock the switch off and the power goes. Yeah. Now, Ray, obviously there's been, you, you know, you are, um, what you call yourself? A, a, I'm a mechatronic engineer. A mechatronic engineer. Uh, obviously, you've, you've proven that you can actually build a DIY barefoot bike for, I reckon, less than £300, correct? Well, I borrowed the battery from you. You borrowed the battery, yeah. And uh, that's the only thing, as far as I'm concerned, that would cost the money. Yeah. So I think I've spent, in all, about 160, 170 quid. <laughs> And I've just bought an additional item, which is the thumb throttle coal Ooh. control. Four pounds 99 from eBay. You're pushing the boat down now, aren't you? Absolutely. Uh, so guys, uh, what, what can you say? Ray Cook, uh, legendary um, mechatronics engineer. Barefoot engineer to boot. Mechatronics en engineer, barefoot engineer. Uh, let us know what you think about uh, Ray's home build barefoot bike. Uh, I'm sure you've got loads of questions to ask him. In the meantime, uh, don't forget to follow us on social media and we'll hopefully see Ray again in the future.